Luke chapter 9 in verse 18, when you have it, say amen. amen. It reads this way, it says, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them this, he said, who do the crowds say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back. Now here's the key question. But Jesus said to them, he asked, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And that's what I want to answer this morning. The title of my message is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Before you're seated, look at your neighbor and ask them, who do you say that he is? You may be seated this morning. Who is Jesus? You know, Jesus, in his wisdom, and how many know Jesus has great wisdom? Jesus, in his wisdom, actually posed this question to his disciples because Jesus understood then, just as he understands today, that, someone, that, that Jesus is someone different to every type of person. He knows that just like then, that today, he is someone different to every type of person. And here's what I want to say about that is that even though we all gather under the same roof of the church, we all have a different view of Christ. We're all different. We all have a different experience. That's why Jesus was so wise and actually so masterful in saying to his disciples, who do the crowds say that I am. And he wanted to hear their opinion. I think Jesus is considering our opinion this morning as well. Because quite possibly you see Jesus different than the person who's sitting next to you. And that even though we're gathered in the same church building, we all have a different view. For someone here this morning, you might see Jesus as your deliverer. Someone here this morning might see Jesus as a miracle worker. Some of you might see Jesus as a guardian. Jesus is my guardian angel. Others might even see Jesus as a genie in a bottle. That you're there to rub him three times and he gives you exactly what you want. We all have a different view. Some others might even see Jesus as a guide. But here's one thing that we can't deny is that Jesus is the most famous man to ever have lived and walked on this earth. In comparison to other great kings, conquerors, and teachers who ever live, I want to tell you about Jesus is that Jesus had more books that have been written about him, more artwork has been painted, more land has been claimed, more kingdoms have been established, more songs have been sung, more churches have been built, more people have been transformed by Jesus. More schools have been established and more arguments have been made about Jesus than any other person that ever walked the earth. See, every person who's ever even had a thought about Jesus has developed an opinion about who he is. But here's what Victory Outreach San Diego needs to know this morning. I want to talk to my church. I want to talk to my church on Palm Sunday, on Passion Week, and here's what I want to tell you today. What every person needs to know about Jesus this, this morning is we need to know who Jesus is according to his word. Because how many know regardless of what you believe, the truth remains the truth? And let me tell you something about the Bible. To read the words of the Bible are literally to read what Jesus has to say about himself. From Genesis to Revelation, every book of the Bible makes one typology or another or makes one mention or another about the living Savior, Jesus Christ. And to read the Bible, how many of you love the Bible? Even if you don't read it, how many love it? Okay, I encourage you to open it up from time to time. But when you begin to read the Bible, essentially, you are reading Jesus' autobiography. The Bible says in the book of John, chapter 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He. Someone say he. he. Someone say Jesus. Jesus. 
Jesus was in the beginning. So to read the scripture is to read Jesus' personal life story. That's why when Jesus looked at the disciples, he says, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? There are 35 things that the Bible says about Jesus. So right now, if you take notes, I encourage you to. I encourage you to pray for your fingers right now. <laughs> Just pray for your fingers. Pray for your thumbs because you're going to be going crazy. You, you, you're going to be te texting faster than you text in an argument. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> 35 things the Bible says. Somebody liked that joke. Huh? You're like, that was good, Pastor. That was good. 35 things the Bible says about Jesus. The first thing you ought to know is that in John 1, I mentioned already, it says Jesus is God. Yeah. Jesus is God. We're talking about Jesus this morning. Also, Jesus was never created according to Michael 5, 2. He always was and always will be. According to Colossians 1, 16, Jesus created everything. According to Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus is all powerful. He said, all authority has been given to me on earth and also in heaven. How many can say amen? amen? The Bible also tells us that Jesus is all knowing, Colossians 2, 3. The Bible also says that Jesus is ever present and he's here right now. Amen. How many know we don't serve a dead Jesus? On Friday, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna celebrate the cross of Calvary. We're gonna memorialize the cross of Calvary. We're grateful, but listen, hold on. That's not the point to get happy. The point to get happy is that the tomb was empty on Sunday and Jesus came out of the grave. And how many know he's not a dead God? According to the scripture, Jesus is alive. And according to Matthew 28, he is present and he is here right now. Because in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, it says where there are two or three gathered. And how many know we have much more than two or three gathered here? Where two or three are gathered, you know the scripture. He says, there I am in the midst. So you ought to get happy because Jesus is here right now. And you ought to get happy because he's here and he's taking the weight on people's hearts this morning. And he's getting ready to speak to somebody. And he's getting ready to pull somebody out of a depression. And he's getting ready to bring somebody a breakthrough in their life. Are you glad he's here? What does the Bible say about Jesus? The Bible says in Luke chapter 1 verse 35 that Jesus is holy. It goes on to say in Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 that Jesus was humble. This is a good word for leaders. Those of you who lead in the church, lead in the marketplace, lead in your home. The Bible says that Jesus was humble. Philippians 2, 7. And he lowered himself to us as a servant. As a servant. That's a good word. Because sometimes we forget that our Jesus is not a proud Jesus. But he's a humble Jesus. It says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, look at this, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Remember when Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, came and he washed the feet of his disciples? He didn't tell them to wash his feet. Oh, you're not going to get amens on it, but it's, it's good. It's, you got to hear it. You got to hear it. He washed their feet. Made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, but not an ordinary death. Not death by firing squad. Not death by hanging. Death by an excruciating cross. The worst type of death. So what was Jesus, my friend? Jesus was not proud. Jesus was humble. Tell your neighbor, be humble. We're talking about Jesus. Isaiah 53, 11. Jesus is righteous. Zechariah 9, 9. Jesus is just. We also read in scripture that Jesus was perfect and without sin perfect and without sin. In 1 Peter 1.19, Peter wrote, he says, we've been washed with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without spot or blemish. The precious blood of the lamb. We were washed by the spotless, matchless, pure blood of Jesus this morning. 
The Bible also says about Christ that he was gentle, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. The Bible also says about Christ is that he is merciful, Hebrews 2, 17. How many of you want to be like Jesus this morning? The Bible also says about Jesus is that he was a forgiving savior. Jesus is forgiving, Luke 23, 34. And what makes all that so powerful, that he was humble and gentle and merciful and righteous and just and forgiving. What makes it all so powerful is summed up in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, because it says Jesus was also subject to human emotions. He took on this body of flesh. He looked like us. He walked like us. He felt everything that we felt. He felt our pain. He felt our struggle. He felt the, the issues that cloud our heart. He felt the bitterness that cloud our heart. He felt the anger. He felt all the different things that we go through. But I'm grateful that even though he felt the same things, he did it without sinning. He could still forgive. He was still humble. He was still merciful. He was still gentle according to the scripture. And the reason that gives me hope this morning is because it tells me that because he took on the same flesh that we had, it tells me that he cares. Amen. That Jesus is not careless when it comes to you and I, but he cares about what we feel because he felt what we felt. He cares about what we go through because he, he went through what we've gone through. He cares about every little issue, big or small, in our life. Our pain matters to him. He he was in all points tested. He was all in all points tempted. But I'm grateful that where we failed, he passed the test and he made a way for us this morning. And I think some of us ought to get grateful in this place this morning that you have a savior that didn't fall for some of the things that you fall through. And you, you have a savior that made it through some storms that you haven't made it through. You can lean on Jesus this morning because he cares for you. Oh, tell your neighbor, he cares for you. That's why Jesus is able to say to anybody, to anybody, to anybody this morning, he's able to say, come unto me, all you who labor. In other words, I know your labor. I know your pain. That's what we're going to be doing on Easter. Come unto me, all you who labor. Come unto me, who have dropped the cross on the way. Come unto me, those of you that are depressed and angry and hurt and you've been through life's trials and life has gotten the best of you. Jesus says, come unto me and I'm going to give you the rest that you need. I'm going to give you the breakthrough that you need. I'm going to give you exactly what you need. How many can say amen? As we read on about the scripture, 35 things the Bible says about Jesus. We come to a point of worship. We come to a point where we read that Jesus received worship. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible says that Jesus received worship from the angels. That on the day he was born, angels appeared. Angels appeared in his presence to worship him. And, and the Bible also teaches us that he has command of all the angels. The angels know who Jesus is. Here's my question. Who do you say he is? Do you know who Jesus is? Because the, the other question would be, if you knew who he was, then why don't you worship him? Mm. It's about to get heavy in this place. Who do you say that I am, Peter? Who do you say that I am, disciple? Who do the crowd? They say you're a prophet. Don't worship a prophet. They say that you're a good teacher. Don't worship a good teacher. Pastor Al is a good teacher. Don't worship a good teacher. Don't worship Pastor Al. But Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he does. Oh. Come on and help me. I want my worshipers to help me. Who do you say that I am? Because the Bible says that the angels bowed down before him. The Bible also teaches us that Jesus not only received worship from angels, but in John 9, 38, he received worship from men and women. The Bible says in Luke 24, verse 52, this is a good one for some of you leaders who don't like to worship. It says the disciples worshiped him. I think sometimes leaders get too deep. But I can't worship because I, they're not singing my song. Listen, whether they're playing the song or not, you ought to worship him. Because of Peter worship. 
and if Paul worshiped them and if Matthew worshiped them and Luke and John, come on somebody, do I have any people that know how to give God the praise that he deserves? See, even the devil knows. Say, neighbor, even the devil knows. Even the devil knows that Jesus is worthy to be worshiped. Because the devil was the, was the head angel. He was Lucifer. He was the head angel and his job was to worship God and to bring the heavenly worship and to lead the heavenly worship. But when he came out of heaven, his whole spirit shifted because the Bible says in James chapter 2, 19, that Jesus causes the demons to tremble in fear. And that's why I got to ask you one more time. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you believe him to be? Because if you believe that he is the son of God, and if you believe that he did die for your sins, and if you do believe that he conquered death, hell, and the grave, and came out of the grave on Sunday, then you ought to get up and begin to worship. You ought to get up and worship him. Mom and dad, you ought to get up and worship him. You ought to teach your children to worship him. He's either king or he isn't. But I'm talking to some people this morning that say Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. Woo. That ought to change your whole life. You should never come to church late. Some people come to church and say, I just want to get the word. Brother, you can't get the word until you worship God correctly. Well, I just want to get inspired and get a few tickles on my skin and a few goosebumps. Listen, brother, none of that's going to happen until you learn to worship God, until you learn to prepare your heart, until you give glory where glory is due and honor where honor is due. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. Some of you are looking at I love this service because I could get a little bit more raw with you guys. Some of you look at me like, yeah, I still ain't going to worship. <laughs> oh, yes, you will. Oh, yes, you will. <laughs> because the Bible also teaches that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And it also teaches in Philippians 2.10 that in the end... Every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess. So you ought to learn to worship Jesus now. Because when we get to heaven, all we're going to do is worship him. All we're going to do is praise him. All we're going to do is give him glory. You better start learning to praise. Some of you need to get out of your chair this morning and give him a praise. Come on and give him a praise. Give, give, come on up, Matthew. Give him a praise in this place. Even if he never did anything for you, come on and praise him because he's God. Come on and praise him because he died on the cross. Come on and praise him because he still does miracles. Woo, hallelujah. You can go ahead and be seated. I love preaching about worship. If you come to Victory Outreach, we're going to teach you about worship. We're going to teach you how to praise God in the good times and also in the bad times. Some of you came in here discouraged. Some of you leaders came in discouraged, came in angry, came in upset, came in tired, came in wore out. But I came to realign your spirit with the cross this morning. In the end, we're all going to worship. Thank you, Matthew. The next thing the Bible teaches us is that Jesus is also rejected by the world. John 1, through 11, chapter 1, verse 11. Jesus is loved by, and followed by some. By some. The Bible also tells us that Jesus is hated, was hated, will be hated, will continue to be hated and despised by others. We know that they whipped him. We know that they mocked him. We know that they spit on him. We know that they shamed him. We know that they beat him, that they did all the worst things that you can do to him. And they're still doing it today. They're still doing it today. They're still spitting on Jesus and mocking Jesus. See, there's those who reject him, those who uh, despise him. 
some that disregard him and ignore him. They deny him. And that there are still some that even in the midst of all that, who will love him and follow him wherever he says to go. And I want to tell you, I don't want to be one of those ones that mocks the Lord. I don't want to be one of those ones that comes to church and plays games. I don't want to be one of those ones that doesn't take the Lord seriously. I, I, I want to learn to love God. I want to follow him wherever he leads me. How many want to be in that group here today? You see, the Bible teaches us who he is. And we see also that even Jesus himself was forsaken by his own father for a, a moment in time. If you study the cross, as many of you will this week, you'll, you know that there was a moment where the cross, where, where the cross brought darkness. And there was a time where darkness covered the land. And, and that was a time where God turned away from his own son who he loved so much. The Bible says his own begotten son. And he turned away from his son who he loved so much. Why? The reason he, he turned away wasn't because of his son. It was because of our sin that came upon the son. And, and the darkness of our sin that when Jesus was hanging on that cross, he was not only dying for the sins that were committed already, but he was dying for the sins that are yet to be committed. He was dying for the sins that you committed last night. He was dying for the sins that you're going to commit tomorrow. Even the most heinous sins that some of you are not proud about, and even the darkest sins that you see in the world, Jesus died for those sins. But those sins are so dark that God for a moment had to look away because a holy God cannot look upon sin. He can only judge sin. And as Jesus hung on that cross, Jesus, Jesus wasn't there to judge our sin. Jesus was there to be the perfect sacrifice for our sin. See, some of you still won't worship God. When you understand that he was the perfect sacrifice, that he took on all of our sin and the sin of the world and his father had to look away from him for a moment. But understand, because the father looked away from him for a moment, that moment has given you and I eternal access into his presence. That's why you don't need a priest. That's why you don't need to kill a lamb or, or give, kill a turtle dove or sacrifice a bull on the altar of sacrifice. I came to tell you the perfect sacrifice has already be give, been given. And when you come to the house of the Lord, you can come directly into his presence. And if you're going to come into his presence, you might as well come in praising him. You might as well come in worshiping him. He broke the chains. He tore the veil. That's why when we gather again on Friday night, I want to see everybody here. I want to see you here with your children. I want to see you here with your grandchildren. I want to see this place packed out because it's not going to be a funeral, baby. We're not coming into church on Good Friday to have a funeral. We're coming in to get direct access into the presence of God because the veil has been torn. The sacrifice has been made. In fact, you ought to go ahead and give him praise right now because the Holy Spirit is here. Woo. Tell your neighbor, you have access. You have access into his presence. And we know this is that Jesus, the Bible says, he rose from the dead. And not only did he rise and is he living, but if you believe for him to be living then you also believe that he's going to be coming back. He's coming back again. Now, do we still believe in the second coming? Because let me tell you, he's coming back. He's not coming back for a lukewarm church. He's not coming back for a compromising church. He's coming back for a church that is working out their salvation with fear and trembling. He's coming back for a church that knows how to worship him. He's coming back for a church that is holy and striving for holiness. How many know he is coming back? Let me give you the final things here and I'll be done. What does the Bible say about Jesus? Did you get something this morning? Is that Jesus is the fulfillment of every Old Testament prophecy. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. 
The Bible also teaches us in 1 John 3.18 is that Jesus destroyed the works of Satan and his power over us. That when Jesus was on the cross, not only did he forgive us of our sins, watch this, but he disarmed the powers of the enemy in our life. He disarmed the powers of the enemy in our life. So in other words, what I'm saying to you is that you are not bound by sin. You choose to sin. You're not bound by drugs. You choose to get high. You're not bound by alcohol. You make the choice to put that alcohol down your throat. Because if you're a child of God, sin has no power over you. Sin has no legal right over you. I'm preaching the gospel to you this morning. Too many Christians are depressed because some doctor told them they're supposed to be. I came to tell you, if the blood of Jesus covers your life, depression cannot hold you. The powers of Satan were disarmed at the cross of Calvary. The devil was placed under the feet of Jesus and victory was transmitted to his people. We are not defeated outreach. We are victory outreach. We have the power of the Holy Ghost. Tell your neighbor, you're set free by the power of Jesus. Woo, I feel the Lord. Is God good this morning? He defeated the enemy. The Bible says in John 3, 16, he gives us eternal life. But the Bible also says in John 10, 10, that he gives us abundant life. Abundant life. In other words, if Jesus is your judge, then he just gave you a double life sentence. That you're not only going to have eternal life in heaven, but as you walk this earth and wherever you set your free your feet God has given you that territory he says walk with your head up don't walk in pride walk in confidence knowing that I am with you and if I be with you who could be against you greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world no weapon formed against you shall prosper hey come on and thank you for that abundant life you can have joy. You can smile. You can dance. You can jump. You can. Hey. What's his name? Who do you love? Who's in the house? Come on and give him one more big praise, everybody. I'm done. Woo. Be seated real quick. As the team comes. Come on. Let's straighten out our wheel, guys. Let's straighten out our wheel. Let's straighten out our alignment. Let's recalibrate. Can I hear an amen? Let me tell you this is that, man, look at all the things the Lord gives us. And then on top of it, the Bible says that Jesus gives us the power of the Holy Spirit. All that, and we haven't even got the Holy Ghost yet? Do you realize how powerful you are already? <laughs> Acts 1.8, right? You shall receive what? When the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And then he gives us a mission to fulfill. This is all Jesus' plan. Matthew 28, 19, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize him in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit right now. We'll be with you. He, he, he gives you all this power, but then he tells you this. Don't keep it to yourself. Take what I've given you and then go out and build my kingdom by sharing what I've given you and putting it in the life of others. Hey. That's what we're trying to do, huh, Mayor? We're, trying, we're not trying to change people. We're trying to change cities. And we're not trying to change cities. We're going to change cities. We're going to change nations. And we're going to change continents. Because we are victory outreach. And we have the kingdom of God in us. Tell your neighbor, you got to share it. 
And then the last thing is this. Did you take all the notes? Yes. I want to see your notes after service. You're like, I don't know, Pastor. You're going to have to, well, go on YouTube. You go watch it, get all the notes. Some of you are showing me your notes. Hey, Amen. I believe you. I believe you. The last thing is this, 30, number 35, Jesus gives our lives meaning because of the gospel. Do you ever ask yourself, why do I come to church? And I know some of you new ones are like, because I love it. I know, I know, I know you. you. Stay like that. Amen. But <laughs> Let me talk to some of you that might have lost the honeymoon a long time ago. It's okay. Trust me. If you're a veteran, you know what I'm talking about. But you ever ask yourself, why do I come every Sunday? Sit in the same seat. <laughs> Sing some of the same songs. Hear a similar message every week. Why do I do this? It seems like madness sometimes. But you know why we do it? Because we recognize it's the gospel that gives our life meaning. <laughs> It's this power and this message that gives our life meaning. We determined in our hearts that we would not allow drugs and alcohol to define who we are going to be. We, we, just, we determined it. No, 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 no. We determined in our hearts that we wouldn't let a divorce define who we're going to be. We determined in our hearts that we wouldn't let abuse and anger and depression and fear define. Am I talking to the right people? We, we determine that, that, no, 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 that's not, that's not the label. We determine that we would allow money to define what we're gonna be. We recognize that if it had not been for the Lord, we would not have the value. We would not have the meaning. We would not have, the, oh, come on somebody. Who would we be without the Lord Jesus? Who would we be without the church? Who would we be without the Bible? Who would we be without the ministry God called us to? Even the words that come out of our mouth. Think about it, guys. Even the words we speak. The gospel gives us meaning. The gospel gives us power. And the beautiful thing is that the power that Jesus gave then is the same power he's giving now. Because Paul the Apostle said one more thing about the Lord, number 36. <laughs> Take your notes. He said, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchanging, he's immutable. He's sovereign, omnipotent, omniscient, immutable. And he's here right now. He's here right now. And you know what we need to do? Let's all stand. We need to recalibrate our focus. Some of you have taken, it's not that you don't have passion. It's that your passion has been placed on the wrong thing. Some of you even do ministry with a passion, but you've lost the real passion. That's why when you take ministry from people, they fall to pieces because they built their house on the wrong foundation. And we've got to recalibrate our passion back to the cross. There's three things that Jesus is to me and to you. Number one, he's our firm foundation. Number two, he's our frame. And number three, number three, he's our future. Firm foundation, frame, and future. I want to give you this one last little nugget before you go home. My wife's been redecorating my office this week. Yesterday she took me to, or day before, to go Hobby Lobby. It's a wonderful place. If you've never been there, go to Hobby Lobby. It's a cool. It's great. Jen gave me a coupon for 50% off. I came to find out you don't even need it. Everything's already 50% off. It's a wonderful place. Christian owned. Right here? 
National City, I believe. And we picked out some pictures, and then we're going to frame them. I learned a few things about frames. Number one is that the cheaper the picture, the cheaper the frame. You never put a high-value frame on a cheap picture. But when you have something that is expensive, a picture that is very heavy in price or priceless, you have to put an even more quality frame on it. And I learned a few things. Why? Because the frame plays a critical role in the piece of art. Number one, the, the frame steadies the artwork. It's going to speak to someone. Steadies the artwork. It, it supports the artwork. It supports the painting. It causes for that painting to be sturdy, not flimsy. Without the frame, it'll flop around. With the frame, it's stiff. But then it also stretches it so that every detail can be seen on the painting. Jesus is our frame. He supports our life. Without him, we would be flimsy. Just like some are, they're so flimsy because they haven't made Jesus King of Kings and Lord of Lords yet. And once you make him your frame, all of a sudden, some of you will catch that on the way to Denny's. And then as he stretches you out, the frame stretches you out. Now, the person viewing the painting can look at the details of the painting. It's not flimsy, it's steady. So now I can really inspect it and take a look at how the painting looks. But here's the third benefit of the painting. I came to find that the more expensive the painting, the more expensive the frame. Because one of the key roles of the frame is to protect the beauty and the ever-changing beauty of the picture. When you go to the Louvre in Paris, I've been there. When you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, I've been there. I've even been to the Sistine Chapel. They're surrounded by these heavy frames. Some of the frames even protrude out like claws. The painting is in there, but the frame is heavy and it's strong and it's super heavy. Take 10 men to carry it and it protrudes out. And the purpose of the frame is to protect the artwork because as time goes by, there's touch-up required. They just sold a painting, Leonardo da Vinci painting recently for $175 million. And it's been around for centuries and it had been retouched. And different painters and artists had made it fresh and redone it. Just like some of your lives, God's always working on us. God's always freshening us up. God is always patching up areas that are going dead. Come on, somebody. When you lose that fire, he knows how to put that fire back. When you lose that passion to pray, he knows how to put that passion back. But the frame, watch this, the frame protects the painting. And it protrudes out and it tells the person looking at the painting, don't touch. Don't, don't, don't touch. You, you, you can look, but, 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 but don't touch. Come on, somebody. Jesus is our friend. <laughs> when Job was going through it, Satan said, look at him. And, and Jesus, God said, okay, do what you got to do, but, 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 but don't touch. That's the voice of Jesus interceding for you and I. When the devil tries to come against you, he says, you can throw everything you want at him, but, 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 but don't touch. Because they've made me their king. They've made me their savior. They've made me their Lord. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And I'm watching over my word to perform it in their life. You need to let Jesus be your frame. This Woo. So I've been getting hit. It's because you're not protected. When marriage is getting hit, are you in the frame? Are you worshiping the Lord? Are you making him number one in your life? And I, I tell you, this word came from my heart. I was excited to preach it all, all week. Because I think many of us here today, regardless of where you are spiritually, this is the week where we need to recalibrate our life back to the cross. 
This is the week where you need to take your focus off whatever you're focusing on. Well, my mar- Don't worry about your marriage. Focus on Christ. Well, my job, forget your job. Focus on Christ. Well, this sickness in my body, don't worry about that. Focus on the Lord. He's able to heal you. He's able to do a miracle. You, 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 you got to focus. I feel like that's for everybody. I don't care if you're a leader or you're newly saved. You, you got to focus today. And, and I want to pray for those of you here today. They say, Pastor, that's the message I needed to kick off this Passion Week. I, I'm going to take my focus and put it back on the cross of Calvary. For some of you, that means getting your worship back, getting your prayer life back. I don't know what it is. But what I want to do this morning is I want to open up these altars. And I want to invite anybody here. Whether you're